Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the Science for a Sustainable Future webinar uh, about energy and science communication. Our event today is a joint initiative of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network and the Springer Nature Publishing Group. I'm Mark Fischetti, your moderator. I'm a senior editor at Scientific American Magazine, where I oversee all of our sustainability coverage, which includes climate, weather, environment, energy, food, water, biodiversity, it's a lot. Um, I've been at Scientific American in 16 years, and I am looking forward to our time together today. By the way, if you see me looking down occasionally, that's because I'm taking notes with a good old pen on good old paper. Um, and we will be monitoring the chat uh, for questions later on. We have a tremendous audience today. More than 800 people are registered for this event. So welcome to all of you. I'm glad you're all here. It shows a lot of interest and excitement. I'm excited about it. Uh, we have four really engaging panelists with us. In a moment, I'll briefly introduce our topic and then each of our speakers will have five minutes to tell you what their main focus is, um, the main points they want everyone to understand. Uh, after that, we will go into discussion and we'll take audience questions. Uh, a few housekeeping items, um, probably everyone has done at least one of these by now, but uh, we are holding today's meeting in Zoom webinar, so audience members will be muted and cameras turned off, but please feel free to send your questions. Um, you can use the Q&A uh, button or the chat button down in the menu bar. Um, today's webinar will be recorded, and the recording will be shared shortly after the event. If you do drop out at any point, um, please just use the same login link to come back in again. So our topic, we are here today to explore how all of us can best communicate with the world about energy and science. The energy crisis is impacting citizens and governments around the world. So it's important to consider how energy research, data, advice, and just general information is communicated to different stakeholders by different stakeholders. Um, this includes communicating the great impact energy has on so many of the UN's sustainable development goals, not just the obvious ones, but also gender, justice, education, health. Um, effective communication means transparency, accountability, trust, and increased understanding, which can improve the future for everyone on our famous favored planet. So. Um, let's get to it. Um, Simon uh, will be our first speaker. Simon Evans is deputy editor and senior policy editor at Carbon Brief, where he covers climate and energy policy. He has a PhD in biochemistry and previously worked for the environmental journal, The Ends Report, where he's covering topics including climate science, air pollution, and many other things. Um, Simon, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for the uh, introduction, Mark, and, and uh, thanks to the team for the invitation to join the panel today. Um, I hope there's not too much background noise um, in a, a public space, unfortunately. Um, but I'll just get straight to my opening remarks. So, so in in the, some of the promotional materials for this for this webinar, there was a really nicely pithy kind of question that w was sort of uh, posed to the to the panel um, today which is, can you change minds with information? Um, and I guess specifically in relation to, to climate and energy information. Um, so, I mean, I guess to start with emphatically, I would answer yes to that question. You, you certainly can change minds with information, um, but I have got a few minutes to, to go a little bit further than that. So I'd like to explain why I think good storytelling and crucially the right narratives are actually more important than the information alone. So I wanted to just start with an example of some information that changed minds in a really, really significant way. Um, so there's this one, a graph. Uh, I'm not going to show you the graph today, but it's called a Kuznets curve. And a version of a Kuznets curve persuaded the Chinese government to make the, its international pledge to peak emissions. Um, now, you know, that's a one graph. It wasn't the only factor, but it nevertheless is a pretty huge impact for what amounts to quite a geeky graph. Now, as I said, I'm not going to show it to you today because it would take quite a while to explain. I know people say a picture um, is worth a thousand words, um, but in this case, I don't think it's necessary. 
if you want to, to follow the backstory, and it's a really fascinating one, um, you can read, read all about it on, on the Carbon Brief website. Um, it's an article called uh, Nine Key Moments That Changed China's Mind About Climate Change. Anyway, coming back to the graph, the point of it is that it tells a good story. The reason why it was an effective piece of information was, was the storytelling um, aspect of it. And effectively, what, what it says to the Chinese government is you can keep making your people richer, even if you promise to peak your emissions. And the, and the graph uses real data. So the storytelling is, is more compelling as a result. And what it shows is that other countries peaked and then cut their per capita emissions, even as incomes kept rising. And, and that's reassuring, obviously, to the Chinese government that it can safely make that commitment and, you know, assume that it can do the same. Um, now, I want to go on to give you an example where good information, I would say, arguably failed to make a difference because it came with, you might say, in retrospect, the wrong kind of storytelling. So, I mean, I'm sure many of you will remember Al Gore's film, An Inconvenient Truth. Um, the, the pitch for the film says, and I, and I quote, that it makes the compelling case that global warming is real, man-made, and its effects will be cataclysmic if we don't act now. Um, now, obviously, you could argue that, that Al Gore changed people's minds with that film, and I'm sure that is true for some people. But, but what he uh, definitely didn't do was get America to pass meaningful climate policy. Um, and to finish up, just to, to contrast with that example, I'd like to, to, to give you the narrative um, rather than you know, the, that, that storytelling that Al Gore chose to use, the one favoured by President Biden, um, which he's kind of used in successfully pushing through the, the Inflation Reduction Act. So when, when Biden signed that act last year, and you know, obviously that's the largest climate legislation ever passed in the US and, and quite possibly the world, and Biden said, as, as he signed it, that the act was not just about today, it's about tomorrow. It's about de delivering progress and prosperity to American families. And so just to paraphrase, in, in contrast, Gore was saying, we need to make dirty energy expensive because climate change is big and scary. And um, in contrast, Biden's saying, we're going to deliver jobs and progress. And by the way, we're going to cut emissions too. You can tell me later um, which bit of storytelling you think is more effective. That's great, Simon. That uh, a lot has been said about how the Inflation Reduction Act has been presented, and it's been done very well. It's a really good example. I'm glad you brought it up. Um, storytelling. I think a lot of times people think, "Oh, I have to come up with this like novel." <laughs> it's not really. It's telling. You know, that's that story can be short as long as it's clear to people, and it's, it's a story it has a beginning, middle, and an end. It has a point. It has a purpose. So um, that all sounds great. Good. Thanks. Um, okay, good. Our next um, speaker is Runa Das. Uh, Runa is an associate professor at Royal Roads University in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada, and she's up early with us this morning. Thanks, Runa. Uh, she has a doctorate in environmental applied science and management, as well as a degree in psychology. Her interdisciplinary research focuses on residential energy use and how to create an equitable household energy transition in Canada, which includes study of energy poverty. Runa is also the current steering committee chair of women and inclusivity in sustainable energy research. Runa, welcome. Thanks so much, Mark, and very happy to be a part of this panel today. Um, so for, for my opening remarks, I just want to really focus on um, the importance of uh, diverse st stakeholders uh, in the energy conversation. So yes, an energy crisis is most definitely happening, and it's really important for citizens and governments around the world to be taking concerted efforts to better communicate, given that communication is the precursor to action. Communicating about the issues and identifying the challenges can be first steps towards tackling. In this space, I think it's really important to think about what the energy crisis means. It could mean something very different to different stakeholders and to different groups of people. I'm always telling my students and trainees that when we're talking about an issue or asking about an issue, let's try to define and conceptualize it first. If we're not on the same page about what the issues are, well then tackling the issues will be that much harder. And I think it's absolutely fine to acknowledge that there might not be consensus around everything. I don't necessarily think that that should be the end goal. I think more importantly, we need to be listening to each other and gaining diverse perspectives so that we can see where we align, where we do not, and where we can negotiate. 
For example, for everyday households, does the energy crisis mean that energy needs could go unmet? Will citizens be able to afford their energy services? For fossil fuel producers and workers, is the energy crisis a question of less demand for fossil fuels or uncertainty in their role in the future or both? For government and policymakers, does the energy crisis mean immediate energy transition and uncertainty or certainty around what actions to take? So really, there are so many different challenges and questions to grapple with. Often, there's an important concern about reaching policy setters and decision makers and about how to reach them, which is a very valid and important concern. But policy setters and decision makers need to also be thinking about who it is we're asking the questions to and communicating with regarding the energy crisis and its challenges. Essentially, we need to ask who is being involved in the conversations, because it's very important to consider the voices who inform and raise the discussions in our communications. We know that equity, diversity, and inclusion needs to increase in academia. Women and non-binary people face a wide range of challenges in career advancement. This limits the incorporation of a broad range of perspectives and ultimately inhibits innovative solutions to energy system challenges. Gender, race, and other identity factors matter for both the questions we ask and the solutions we find. And though the idea of inclusivity has become the norm, exclusive practices persist in academia policy and practice. So at Women and Inclusivity in Sustainable Energy Research, also known as WISER, we are committed to empowering our membership through professional development, collaboration, and networking for these reasons. Our aim is to motivate women and non-binary academics to diversify voices in the media, diversify informed opinions and knowledge production and sharing in sustainable energy research so that we can be included in the conversations and accordingly the solutions. In the fall of last year, WISER supported a series of symposia that brought together academics, practitioners and the public together, recognizing that conversations need to be had amongst various stakeholders. And as I've mentioned, we've also supported communications training for those in our network to be able to give them a voice and to learn of methods for better communication, recognizing that this in itself is a skill. So I'd like to end on the point that it's not only about how to reach policymakers and decision makers, but I think policymakers and decision makers need to be thinking about who they're asking the questions to and who they're involving in the decision discussions so that we can ensure that multiple voices or myriad voices influence policy and decision making. Great, thanks, Runa. Yeah, you've um, so you have different sets of people uh, who need to send out messages, want to send out messages. You have different sets of people receiving the messages and return to be inclusive. So it's kind of this matrix I'm seeing in my head. <laughs> um, so it's a, it, and we could talk about this later. It's an interesting uh, dynamic that's going on. I think. People often think of communication as one person, one group saying one thing to one receiver, but it's much more intricate than that. So um, we can talk more later about that too. Um, next up is Hannah Safford. Hannah serves as senior policy advisor at the White House Climate Policy Office, where she focuses on climate resilience and transportation decarbonization. Hannah was most recently associate director of the Federation of American Scientists. She served as a policy advisor in the 2020 Biden Harris, sorry, Biden Harris president camp campaign and as a fellow at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And has a PhD in environmental engineering as well as a master's in public and international affairs. Hannah, enlighten us, please. Um, thanks, Mark. So uh, Runa teed me up nicely with um, her closing remarks about um, about policy and decision makers, you know, and uh, as, as you kind of mentioned in my bio, um, I currently work at the White House Climate Policy Office, which was established to coordinate climate policy across the U.S. federal government, but I do have a science background um, and so have worked at both sides of the science policy nexus. And in, in doing that, um, have some sort of like concrete and practical thoughts about what it takes if you're a scientist who's research is policy or decision relevant in some ways, almost everybody's is, um, and how you get that into the hands of policymakers and decision makers, um, and how you 
position it in a way that it materially influences the policies and decisions that are made. Um, you know, and I think one thing that I want to point to at the top is often we synonymize policy with government, um, and certainly government makes policy. But at its core, you know, policy is largely about allocation of resources. Um, if you think about, you know, at your house, if you have a policy, have, if you've got kids and everybody has to have first before anybody can go back and have seconds, that's a policy about allocation of resources. Um, so the private sector, the nonprofit sector, as well as um, the public sector are all instituting policies that have to do with allocation of resources all the time. Um, and I think if you are narrowly focused on putting your research into the hands of government, um, and in particular people tend to have this inclination that the higher up you can go in government, the more effective you're going to be and the greater potential your research is going to have for impact. But if you kind of focus narrowly on the public sector and then focus narrowly on the top of the public sector, um, you run the risk of not, not really tailoring your, uh, your pitch to your audience and not having it ultimately find its hands into the way and find is your research um, into the hands of the people who can do the most with it. Um, so the kind of first piece of advice that I would have is really think about who your audience is um, when you're trying to take your research um, from the lab or wherever in kind of broader hands. You know, is it really technically oriented, in which case you might want to be talking to technical folks at a government agency? Um, is it something that has the capacity to influence private sector procurement, in which case you might want to be talking to a sustainability officer at, um, a, at, a, at a company. Is it something that um, is very like locally or geographically tailored, in which case you might want to be talking to a state or a provincial or a local government official rather than trying to go all the way up to federal government. And certainly in some cases, there's opportunities for federal engagement. Um, you know, then the second concrete thing is really think about synthesizing your research and tailoring it to that audience. Once you've decided who you're looking to engage, you know, recognize that um, a, an, a scientific abstract is, is, or scientific paper is valuable in the scientific realm. But um, if you are pitching to a policymaker, um, a two page policy brief might be something that they're more familiar with. And so, kind of matching the form to the audience as well. Um, and then uh, and then finally, um, really thinking about the policy cycles and decision um, points, the hooks that you can plug into. Um, so for instance, right after a policymaker is elected, that's the time when they're often trying to like really hit the ground running. They're not thinking about their campaign anymore. They don't have a lot of ideas and initiatives already underway, so that can be a really right time to pitch to an elected official. Um, if a company has had really strong earnings, they might be looking to do something more creative, um, or if a current event creates a policy window. So if you do something that's uh, sustainability, or sustainability oriented and you're thinking about Earth Day coming up, so tying into current events. Um, so just to kind of wrap that, um, take an expansive view of policy and decision making, um, you know, really try and pick your audience strategically, synthesize and repackage your research into a way that matches your audience, and then think about opportunities that um, exist to, to plug in um, and don't kind of create all, think of all time as equal. Good, po good points, Hannah. I like the practicality of it. And, and your, your first point about um, so many issues are science driven. We we tend to say that at Scientific American now. It's like every issue is a science issue. I mean, and it it's yeah. maybe not literally true, but there are so many things at um, local level, state level, um, national level, international level that really are informed by science. So I, I think it's a great message for everyone in our audience that your work probably applies to policy to society somewhere along the line. And as you point out, Hannah, so figure out. Where, what level that's at and who you want to try to approach about it. Uh, okay, great. And our fourth speaker, um, Bruno Takahashi. Bruno is a professor of environmental communication at Michigan State University. 
where he has a joint appointment in the School of Journalism and the Ag Bio Research Area. Bruno is a research director of the Knight Center for Environmental Journalism, and he also works with the Health and Risk Communication Center and the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies at Michigan State. Bruno has a PhD in environmental science. Uh, Bruno, good morning. Good morning, Mark, and good afternoon, good, good evening to those uh, who are connecting from other time zones. Um, thanks for the invitation to the UNST, uh, SN, and Springer. Uh, thanks to also my uh, fellow panel panelists, uh, learning a lot already about your work. Um, I want to make um, a couple of points. The first one related to, um, I think connected to what um, what Simon, Hannah, and Aruna have already said. Um, and it's, this is focused on, on the importance of strategy in communication. Um, oftentimes, um, not only in the context of energy or, and science communication, but also in health and environmental communication, which are related uh, areas of, of practice and research, um, we see examples of, of great um, creative engaging um, messaging campaigns that oftentimes don't um, achieve the objectives that are set to, to try to achieve. Um, so it's important to think about um, what strategy we're using uh, in order for us to achieve those goals, larger goals and, and more precise objectives before we start thinking about what tools, what tactics we're going to we're gonna use. Uh, and I'll give you an example. You might see there's an electric bike behind me. Um, I, bought, I purchased that um, last year. Uh, of course, I'm interested in um, lowering my carbon uh, footprint. But more importantly, uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, for a lot of people, um, the decision to engage in specific behaviors, which you could you could construe as a, as an objective of a communication campaign, uh, does not necessarily have to be aligned with what we think uh, is the most important aspect to highlight. So, for some of my colleagues that I'm trying to convince to to bike to work instead of drive their drive their car, is uh, not necessarily to tell them that you need to reduce your carbon footprint, you need to reduce emissions, you need to uh, fight climate change. But I could tell them um, that it's a lot of fun, that it's much cheaper, or that uh, it's better for your health. Uh, so those things have connections, but are not aligned necessarily with the with the traditional messaging that we see of, of perhaps climate or energy energy consumption. So this is what I'm referring to when I say that it's important to think about audience and think. Um, it was mentioned one of, one of my panelists. Think about who your audience is. But more about equally importantly is to think about what goals, what objectives, and, and, and again, and then think about what tactics we could use. We can think about tactics in the, in, in the sense of uh, using social media, using posters, and in the role of news media. Mark, you work, work for Scientific America. What's the role of news media within a larger uh, communication strategy? Uh, but also, again, thinking, going back to this idea of goals and objectives, is thinking about are we trying to change people's minds? Are we trying to change people's beliefs? values? Are we trying to change people's perception, uh, behaviors? Are we trying to change public policy? Uh, are we trying to convince, to give people more knowledge? And, and I would say that knowledge is uh, probably a necessary but insufficient um, factor in people's decision making. Um, so again, thinking about the, the limitations of the information deficit model, um, we need a lot of people make decisions not only based on knowledge, but based on their previous beliefs, their perceptions, their values, their sense of self-efficacy, um, what others around their, their social circle might be doing, so social norms, are, are probably more important um, than knowledge. Emotions are very important in communication. And, and certainly, and I think this was also referred by one of my fellow panelists, uh, we, we really have to think about communication and ditch the old, old model of one-way uh, form of communication and really think about an inclusive uh, form of communication that not only sends messages, but also understands what the social social historical context in which communication takes place and, and, li and really listen to what people are saying, which I think is what Runa, Runa mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, so I'll end, the, end there and looking forward to, to the conversation. Yeah, thanks, Bruno. The, the um, good point about relating climate change to things that people care about um, maybe more than um carbon emissions you know the impact of climate change on health is getting a lot of attention it's really even though that's been around it's really been only in the last year maybe two that that focus has really um, blown up and i think it's because of exactly what you say people are realizing um that's what a lot of individuals care about um it's something that they're willing to 
change their behavior for. So um, um, really good points there. And I'd like to get back to that too. Um, let's, let's start some discussion. Um, I brought up this idea about a matrix, uh, meaning different messages from different groups of people and different recipients. Um, that makes things sound a little more intricate. Um, and I think what everyone here has said is you have to be deliberate about what the messages you want to communicate, um, who you're trying to reach and what you want them to do with it. Um, so let's, let's, let's start with this, um, as a communicator, which we're assuming everyone on this panel and in our audience is going to be a communicator, uh, about energy, about science, about, um, uh, how those things affect the world. How do you avoid uh, preaching to the choir and getting your message out to other audiences like policymakers who need to be reached, but who may have competing priorities or political ties? Um, Hannah, I might ask you to start on that one and then folks feel free to jump in. Sure, so I think, um, you know, I think it's all about repackaging um, and that uh, you put so much effort into your research and it's just a shame if you put all that effort into the research and it doesn't get out into the world. And so I had a former boss who would say, rather than putting 100% of your time into your research, um, put 90% of your time into your research and 10% of the time into the repackaging and trying to get it out there. And so you're really not taking away that much from the time that you're dedicating to the research, the core stuff that you're doing, but you're just flipping that um, allocation of time a little bit to make sure that it has the impact that you're doing all the work for. Um, and it's not a wholesale reinvention of what you've done. It's just a little bit of a re uh, tweaking and a repackaging. So you've already written the summary as an abstract. Now you take that abstract and simplify it into plainer language terms, put it into more of a bulleted format, and proof you've got something that's a little digestible for um, for a policymaker. Or you know you take that and you put it into more of like a bumper sticker message, and that's something that. Um, might get the attention of a, of a news reporter. Um, so, you know, I, I think it, it seems so overwhelming of how can we have two jobs, be it, you know, our research selves and then also have to be doing all of this work out there and socializing, but it really doesn't take too much additional time to do the repackaging. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. And Bruno, I, I meant to say you you um, mentioned the deficit model for those in the audience who may not know the terminology. It basically means... Okay, I'm a scientist, so uh, I'm an engineer, I'm a researcher, so I do my work, I publish my findings, and that's it. And um, er everybody who needs to um, benefit from that, will, it'll just sort of happen. <laughs> um, it doesn't really just sort of happen, and that's what I believe Hannah is saying. Um, you have to make it happen, and you have to take a little bit of time. Uh, there's a couple things related to that. You know, you'll see in more papers now, after the abstract, there's a, a new paragraph that basically says plain language summary. I think that's a first step. Um, and I also think that um, uh, more, I believe it's true that more funding um, sources now in the applications, some of them at least have a line that basically says, what will your public outreach be about this work? And that's both of those things are really maybe sound small, but they're important messages to everybody listening that these things are valued and it's worth spending time on them. Um, anybody else want to, to chime in on this question? Yeah, Simon. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I just wanted to, to come out, just kind of reflecting on my experience uh, as a researcher during my PhD. Um, and I, I mean, I don't think I disagree with anything that, Han that Hannah said, um, or, you know, or that you've, you've said, Mark, but I guess to be just, you know, slightly controversial, I, I would say, you know, we're all storytellers and there's, you know, repackaging for particular audiences is, is great. That's fine. And, you know, plain language summaries and, and all that. I'm, I'm a supporter of those things, particularly as a journalist that's, you know, trying to find papers that are interesting and work out what they're all about. But I would say fundamentally, there's no, there isn't really a good reason why actually abstracts should be written in plain English. Like, what? why are they not? And I know that, that, you know, obviously scientists aren't necessarily expert communicators and that, you know, that's why people might, like me have a, have a niche to carve out and, and a job to do. But, you know, my observation as, as a researcher was that 
particular research groups that were more effective at communicating and you know storytelling about what their research was showing were more successful they got into bigger journals they got you know better slots in conferences and so on and so i think you know it's not only for for the benefit of you know persuading policymakers or talking to different groups but also within your own field it's super super important to be communicating as clearly as possible you know effectively your paper title should be a headline that is going to grab mm. people's attention and if it isn't then it, it's not going to do those things yeah, uh, we we have uh, at Scientific American have started to say that to to researchers too come to us. You should make your paper title a headline. It's be, and because it forces you to think about what your message is. That's what headline does. It's very succinct. Here's my point, <laughs> or here's why this matters. So yeah, good good. Um, um, Bruno, you wanted to add to that? Yeah, thanks, Mark. And I agree with what Hannah and Simon just said. I think it's very important. Um, I, I I currently am work, working on a few projects where we're training scientists to to do that. Um, we're working particularly with uh, scientists from marginalized uh, communities here in the, in, the, in the United States. Uh, but it's also important to think that um, most scientists don't get trained, right? And 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 there are in many cases really bad at communicating um, the research. And, and there is certainly a push um, here in the US as well as other places, I think in Europe as well, to again, to train uh, scientists to, be, to become better communicators, uh, which is perfectly fine. But it's also true that um, there are a ton of great communicators out there. Mark, I mean, Mark, you're an amazing communicator, so <laughs> you're already doing the work. So it's, uh, again, going back to this, this point of strategy is um, we probably should be putting, uh, and then by we I mentioned, I'm, I refer to institutions, whether it's scientific institutions or government institutions, putting a lot more resources, time and effort um, to help the communicators uh, work with the scientists. So um, instead of, you know, of just training the scientists, but you know, uh, providing more resources to professional communicators to do the work. Right. Um, yeah, Runa. Um, yeah, just to add to some of the points the uh, the other panelists have made, um, I think it's really great here to work with people who are experts in the in the space, uh, like Bruno is uh, alluding to. Um, I think policymakers and decision makers don't necessarily read the scientific papers or have the capacity to do so. Um, for example, I've been working on energy poverty research in Canada for the past past few years, and I recently. Uh, co-authored a report uh, for the David Suzuki Foundation, and they're experts in, in communication. And with this report, we were able to uh, disseminate in different ways. So, uh, you know, policy briefs and then webinars for practitioners and, and community members. So really getting out uh, the, the, the messages, the key messages to different groups. And I think this really, um, this really helps with, uh, you know, helping with policy and decisions uh going forward knowing which which are what are the key points you know in 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 the research um runa since since you brought you just brought up your work in uh about energy poverty we do have a question uh, from the audience and I'll, I'll just start weaving things in as we talk um what recommendations can you give to those uh who are working in rural contexts with energy poverty how can how can they give meaning and value to the energy transition to folks who are in those situations? Runa, did uh, thanks. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm thinking about this. I energy poverty uh, research and just the understanding of the issue is proliferating, so that's um, good. I think it's really helpful to connect with. Um, people that are championing or trying to to get the message across to more decision makers and policy setters in, in terms of like, what needs to happen? How do we move forward? I think building community community around these issues is really, really important. You know, form, forming those coalitions um, to advance, um, you know, making the imp issue important is uh pretty critical and and probably first steps um right now great and hannah a, a quick question for you you mentioned policy briefs and one of our um, viewers says what constitutes a good policy brief can you give them a quick summary 
That's a great question. So there's no uh, no set format if this is a policy brief or this isn't a one policy brief, but I think about it as a one to two page summary of the issue that you're trying to communicate. Usually it has a little bit of background on the issue at the top, and then um, it might have a quick summary of your research, and the bulk of it would be dedicated to, you know, how is this um, a recommendation for the audience that you're trying to target, or um, what's the ask? from a particular policymaker. So it might be an act for funding, it might be a suggestion um, to a change in an existing policy. Um, usually the shorter the better, because if you grab somebody's attention, they will come back to you and ask you for more information. But if you give them too much information at the get-go, uh, it becomes overwhelming to them and they often throw it in the garbage. Uh, so th that, that would be my uh, quick hit. Yeah, um, it was sort of legend when Ronald Reagan was president that even on his senior staff, he had a rule, if you can't sum this up for me in one page, then you haven't done your homework. <laughs> um, how much should people, though, stress themselves? Because we even when we're approached as a magazine from people who want to write, there's oftentimes start with this big, long paragraph about how, themselves and how what their qualifications are. Is that something that comes at the end? <laughs> Bruno, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Um, sorry, I was not going to respond directly to that. I was going to go back to the uh, point about energy poverty that uh, Runa, Runa made. Yeah, yeah sure. Go ahead. Um, so, um, yeah, and I, I agree with what, what Runa was, was saying. Um, and I'm going to give you an example of, of what is happening here locally, here in, in the state of Michigan. Just recently, a couple of weeks ago, a neighboring county um, voted down a proposal to develop um, solar a solar farm um, um, in, in, in empty empty land. There's plenty of empty land around here. Uh, the reason why it voted, was voted down, um, um, there were two main reasons. One was because uh, there was a perception by many community members that uh, Chinese interests would would infiltrate um, the local community. Uh, the other factor was uh, related to how uh, a solar uh, farm would impact and change the, um, the qualities and the culture of the place. Um, so there was this, uh, this, this um, sense of, of, of uh, place that was very important for community members, and they didn't want to change the, the character of the place. And the perception was that solar farms would do that. So, so it had nothing to do with again, the, the economics, had nothing to do with the environmental impact. It had to do with two completely different factors. And I think it's very important to understand in where those rural communities, as well as other communities, where are they coming from? And again, thinking about that social, cultural, uh, historical context in which they, they, they are placed. Thanks, thanks, Bruno, for, for um, expanding that point. Um, it, it, just uh, a quick uh, question also from the audience, because I thought this was clever. And also, um, this is a, uh, a webinar of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. So um, the question is why, when, uh, in, in all the various things that we've just been talking about, um, would it be smart and why don't we specifically identify the sustainable development goal, even by number and name, um, when you're trying to convince an audience to buy a new policy or change behavior? Um, you know, so many countries have, have, have ratified the the SDGs, as we call them, um, is it helpful to really point those out in whatever pitch you're making? Uh, Simon, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to disagree with that. The premise of the question, I would say, specifically naming and by number and name, sustainable development goals is going to be almost completely meaningless to most people. Um, I, I certainly couldn't, you know, tell you what number the you know the sustainable energy for all goal is you know um, and i work in in this area a lot so you know i think to to that kind of storytelling aspect like what, what basically and, and and the policy brief thing really is that you know the, the what you're trying to do is persuade someone they should care and then tell them what they can do about it fundamentally that that's your goal and telling them some obscure name and and, and number is not going to help with that Okay, maybe later on. <laughs> Hannah. That's, that's interesting because I disagree with that. I think actually for some audiences that can be very resonant. You know, it's good to, um, sometimes reminding an entity of a commitment that they've made, you know, look like your country signed on to these sustainable development goals. And so if you're 
if you've got a goal to show that you can deliver on your promises that you've made, and this ties into that, certainly you also want to make the, um, how is it going to benefit like that person in particular or that person's agency? But if you can tie it back to an overarching thing that um, a country has already committed to, then that just adds more, um, more fuel to your pitch. So as as we have all sort of been saying, it depends. Uh, it, again, it's being deliberate about who you're trying to reach, right? What audience you're trying to reach. Um, uh, good. Okay. Great. Um, let, let me let me um, bring up another topic, and I think there may be a question that relates to this. Um, um, and Bruno, maybe you could start on this one with misinformation on the rise. Um, how do we speak to skeptical audiences? Um, how can how can how can uh, science communicators, energy communicators sort of fight the tactics of trying to cast doubt on science and cast doubt on the people doing the science. You know, this is you know, doubt the messenger, doubt the message and doubt the messenger. Yeah, that's a great question. It's not, there's no single easy answer to this one. Um, I have a, um, a, a colleague um, who um, and you probably will know the, the work that um, uh, Ed Maybach has done with the global, uh, six, um, uh, global warming six Americas. Um, he he often says that um, we need um, clear, easy messages repeated often by trusted and credible messengers. Um, so so one of the main principles in in communication, especially in advertising, is repetition of, of simple messages. Uh, you think about I mean, ads from Coca Cola or any or Burger King or any major uh, brand like that. It's it's a very simple message, and you see it all, all the time, right? So they spend a lot of money on advertising to make sure that that brand is, is uh, up front. Uh, certainly, if you're working in the energy sector or climate or, or environmental sector, you don't, you're not operating with the budget that, um, that Coca-Cola is operating with. Uh, and certainly, there is plenty of evidence that, that shows that um, there are um, strategic efforts by um, some actors, especially in the fossil fuel industry, that are pushing this information and this information, and, and they've been doing it for, for decades. Um, there's plenty of social science research that, that shows that. Uh, now, um, how to combat that? Um, I mean, it's it's important again to to have those trusted messengers, and those trusted me messengers vary. I think somebody else mentioned mentioned it earlier. Will vary by audience, right? Um, there is also in thinking about um, skeptical audiences. We know that at least in the context of climate, that at least here in the United States, um, about ten percent of the of the U.S. population is is completely dis disengaged, skeptical of climate change, to, does not believe in climate change. And those people are probably most likely not going to change their minds. Um, so you could try to convince them, but you're likely to fail. Um, however, there is a group of about 15, 20 percent of the youth population that it's somewhere in between. That it's not fully engaged, um, but but are perhaps considering uh, doing something about it. Strategically, that even would make a lot more sense to focus on those individuals than those who are completely skeptical of climate change. Uh, Simon, go ahead. Yeah, so um, thanks. Yeah, I mean, it's such a such a, a pertinent issue at the moment. Um, we, you know, we've seen, I mean, day by day, the the Twitter sphere seems to get more and more depressing in terms of the the volume, uh, and and you know the level of of misinformation around around climate change in particular, but but you know all sorts of other issues. Um, there's a, a couple of things I very much uh, agree with with what Bruno was saying about about who you're trying to talk to and you know there's there's certain audio, certain se segments of society that it's just a total waste of time um spending you know spending time talking to them you know Catherine Hayhoe the climate scientist who who does a lot of you know spends an awful lot of effort trying to communicate with with different people about climate change and and talk to skeptical audiences makes the same point that you know that that hardcore you're just you know you just kind of you're just wasting your effort and actually for some of those people that is their aim is to to kind of suck you into pointless conversations um but then there obviously is that you know there's a bigger chunk of people that actually can be persuaded and i think in that case you know again i would come back to the power of storytelling you you, you know the the advertising example is quite a good one you know you don't see burger king kind of responding to attacks on burger king or you know burgers or whatever they're 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 pushing they're not you know they're not kind of arguing with with critics they're pushing their own positive narrative about how great it is to eat a burger king burger um and similarly with you know with climate information 
there, there is definitely a danger if you spend a lot of time kind of engaging with with skeptical narratives fact checking things i mean we do do quite a lot of fact checking at carbon brief but we're always very conscious that that in in doing that we're not kind of reinforcing or promoting the skeptical message that that we're fact checking so you know you don't want to do a fact check saying like fact check it's it's not true that global warming stopped 10 years ago right because then people are just reading global warming stopped 10 years ago that's probably the message overridingly that they're going to take home so you have to kind of find ways of turning around that and, and telling a different story which in the course of, of telling it you you actually uh, debunk the, the misinformation uh, right right um uh, 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 that gets back to this idea of a simple short message you know climate change was over 10 years ago okay done not going to read any further it's a good headline um um Rooney you want to jump in and can I add to um what you're about to say uh because we have a uh, question in the chat um which with your psychology background probably is best for you how do we get people to talk and listen to one another um so I'll quickly I just want to talk make a couple points about the misinformation uh um, oh, yeah. uh question uh, I think we really need to be supporting high quality science and research um so you know to kind of not let misinformation get through the cracks um good robust science is really important for example in Canada there's a lack of energy data uh, and this is really problematic um for doing research generally um having you know not having access to data as a researcher is just uh, it's it's not great um but also right now during the energy crisis and transition um you know how can we give decision makers policy setters evidence based knowledge when we aren't really investing in scientific uh, infrastructure so i think that's really really critical um for you know good good science and good research um and then i forget the other question how do we get people to talk and listen to one another especially, maybe especially in communities that are more vulnerable or isolated This is a very tricky question. I, you know, I don't know what necessarily the solutions are. I think um, we could invite people to the conversation. I think that's a really great starting point. Make things or try and attempt to make things more participatory. We're seeing this more in research and academic research, uh, action research, participatory research. Um, and so inviting those conversations, and I, and I feel like inviting the conversations is a, is a place where people can start to feel comfortable to be able to voice their opinion. And I, I, I'd like to add something um, of a good friend of mine, colleague who was at Scientific American for quite a while. He's now the science curator at TED Talks. Um, David Biello is his name. And he says often to people who come wanting to give a talk that, all your information is good and you can reach people's heads that way but if you really want them to take home your message you have to reach their hearts so think about what matters to them and um most as an audience and is and, and i think it works um one-on-one -on -one when you're talking with someone Catherine Hale, who simon mentioned says this as well that you know if, you, if you're going to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with your neighbor what matters to your neighbor about um energy or the environment and think about addressing them in that way. So um, it's a common message that can be used at all, all sorts of different levels. Um, Bruno, you wanted to jump in? Yeah, it, yeah, it's um, it's a very tricky question, very difficult question. And again, here in, here in the United States, um, we, we see that the high level of polarization that exists in any, any issue related to, to energy, climate, environment, um, you name it, health, you name it now, nowadays. Uh, but um, and although those um, the levels of polarization um, they have increased in in the last few years, uh, at at the core, um, I think people people agree on, on certain basics basic things. Like everyone likes um, would like to have a live a, a good life. Everyone enjoys clean air, clean water, recreational opportunities, um, their personal freedoms. I think across the political spectrum, we all agree on those things. Uh, where we disagree is how to achieve them. Right, so the process in which to achieve them. So I think it's important to, to to take that step back and think about what are those fundamental values in which we all agree on, and start from building from them there instead of start arguing about how to get there in the first place. All right, um, Hannah. 
Yeah, I think that's right. I think um, really just recognizing that that people are people and that we all share some humanity. You know, I agree with what Bruno and Simon said earlier that there um, is always going to be that that slice of people who um, aren't worth spending your time on. You know, their agenda is just so dramatically different from yours. They're not looking to engage in a productive conversation and, and you can't sort of bridge every chasm. Um, but most people, you know, are, are coming from a good place of wanting to make their life better, wanting to make society better. And I think that if you're a if you're in a decision or policy making capacity and you are talking to an external stakeholder, you know, asking the question of how can we help you, or if you're somebody who is trying to um, pitch your research to somebody in decision or policy making capacity, asking, you know, what what can we do as a scientific community, as the advocacy community to help you achieve your policy goals? At the end of the day, we all um, you know, share the same planet, and many of us are trying to make it better, even if we sort of differ in our interpretations of what better means. I think also one of the most eye-opening things for me about coming and working at, at the White House is it's so easy to get lost in the institution, you know, especially something that has the reputation of a scientific American or the White House and it's you know a scientific American put out this or the White House issued this statement and we forget that at the end of the day like the White House is a building scientific American mm-hmm. is a magazine it is the people that are behind those um, working at those places that are actually developing the policy that are making the editorial decisions and so if you can speak to those people as people that gets you a long way towards um, effective communication. Yeah, I think um, this is a a great discussion, and I think it also addresses a question that comes up that people find really difficult to handle, which is, you know, there's a lot of we versus them in current energy discussion, climate discussion, Republicans versus Democrats, fossil fuel proponents versus renewable energy proponents, scientists versus deniers, you know, and so on. Um, And I think everything that you all have just said really applies to exactly that same situation. Uh, so it's a good it's a good message to keep in mind. Um, there's a there's an interesting question that came up, which I would just throw out for um, uh, it might be Hannah or Runa, but anyone obviously. Um, what about the role of citizen social science in making communication better to both the ends and the policymakers as well as the energy users? So citizen science, citizen social science. Um, that's a way that people can get involved with research um, as private people. Um, what do you think about that? Um, so I, I prefer to use the term community science because not everybody okay. is a citizen who might be engaging in it. Um, but yeah, right, right, right. so I think it's I think it's sort of all about you know trying to make issues that are complex and and don't seem like they have relevance to your day-to-day have some salience and so like you know I think a lot about um, of course in the United States we've got these big huge national parks uh, but a lot of people can't access the parks you know they don't have the money they don't have the time to go take the trip that it takes to get to a national park especially if not one is not nearby Um, and so then the importance of conservation um, doesn't really resonate, but if you have an urban park in your neighborhood, you know, that's something that you can engage with and same kind of thing holds for kind of like science with a capital S and community science, you know, people think of like science as this thing that you have to be super highly educated and have access to a lot of lab equipment to be able to do. And so then why should I care about scientific funding? But um, if you have community science engagement, community science initiatives that um, are like, look, you know, science is about curiosity and discovery and you can contribute to that too, then people care about the broader thing. Yes, science, um, curiosity, mystery, exploration, discovery, all of these things are so fundamental to science. I think a lot of people when they're when they're kids, those are the kinds of aspects of science that are most um, engaging in and, and most kids won't even think about it as science. It's like, oh, this cool discovery, this cool mystery. Um, the more you can do that in communicating, I think you you just reach people on a really basic level. It's a good good way to think about it. Um, 
We have uh, about five minutes left and we have a lot of questions. Thank you folks in the audience. I really appreciate that. Uh, we have people behind the scenes and I thank them right now um, who are kind of trying to coordinate <laughs> the questions and, and present them to me in a way that I can read them quick. So uh, thanks for that, but uh, thanks to the audience. Um, um, there's, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, there's an interesting question um, that I'm not sure we want to end on. So let's just get a quick answer. Um, there's this whole worry about woke everything. And um, is there any danger in, you know, presenting clean energy as kind of a woke thing? I guess not. <laughs> I, I mean, I think, you know, that we've definitely seen people trying to kind of tie, tie climate action in, in with the whole culture war um argument and you know it's it's kind of pretty predictable it's pretty pretty depressing i think i think the thing that that kind of mitigates against it being successful i i would suggest is that you know with the place we're in now with clean energy where it is fundamentally it's cheaper it's more secure and by the way it cuts emissions i mean that that's kind of the basis of, of biden being able to say what he said about the the ira um right. is you know wind and solar are the cheapest forms of electricity generation in most parts of the world if we'd you know if we'd been in this situation you know this same conversation five or ten years ago that might not have been the case um and it you know would have been easier for for people to to make arguments against against the the, the energy transition and for, for politicians to be able to kind of you know adopt some of those arguments if it suited their agenda but because it's you know fundamentally it's clean cheap and secure that makes it quite difficult Mm. Right. Um, good. Let's end, let's end on something. If, if we're, we're supposed to be thinking about what matters to people personally, um, let's end on this um, question, which is um, there are some parallel issues in communicating about um, climate change, clean energy, science, and about communicating about the pandemic, which we all are very familiar with. Um, do you see any lessons from how pandemic communication was done that we can apply to science communication overall and, and energy communication here. I'm thinking about simple, clear messages, avoiding mixed messages, um, how to communicate certainty versus uncertainty. Um, anyone want to tackle that one? I can try <laughs> a shot of that. I think there's a lot of lessons. To learn from the uh, from the pandemic, um, there's a, good, a lot of lessons about what not to do. I think um, certainly um, you mentioned. Um, I think your, the last concept that you mentioned, uncertainty. Um, we 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 know um, again from decades of research that, especially in news media outlets, the news coverage tends to either completely ignore uncertainty or completely blow it up out of proportion. And neither of those are are are. Uh, conducive of good communication um, uh, messages. So it's important I think, for um, communicators, whether in science or energy communication, to, to acknowledge a level of, of uncertainty um, because it's um, oftentimes things don't work out as, as planned. And I haven't read Anthony Fauci's uh, latest uh, interview, I think came out a couple of days ago, where he recognizes some of the, um, some of the problems in, in their approach. Uh, but I think there, was a, 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 there were many problems in terms of you know, communicating that uncertainty. So for a lot of people, when things don't don't happen as as expected or as predicted, uh, people lose trust in, in those messengers. And I think it, that's an important thing to uh, to try to to retain that trust with your audiences and, and acknowledging that there are some things that we know and some things that we do know uh, is very important. All right. Um, I, I'm sorry I threw this out because now um, Hannah, if you don't like to chime in, Simon. If you could both do that really fast, and then I have to wrap this up with one minute. <laughs> Go ahead, yeah, I, I just think it, um, you know a parallel that they share is that neither of these are are totally gloom and doom stories. You know, these are about actually the power of human innovation when we work together. You know, we got uh, these transformative vaccines to market in a year, and you know, to Simon's earlier point, we're like driving down the cost of clean energy like we are solving these are big complex problems and to, you know, together as a global society we are we are solving them yeah good point great point simon 
quickly. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that, Hannah. I'm 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 very loath to to shift to a slightly more negative tone, but but just to say, I mean, it, it's been super fascinating uh, to watch the parallels between um, you know kind of COVID misinformation and climate misinformation. Just so many of the kind of the the features of the debate that played out over the last decade in, in climate world just being replayed, and and moreover, I mean, this, I don't know if this is true elsewhere, but certainly in the UK, many of the exact same characters. The same the same commentators and journalists and politicians you know pu pushing uh climate uh sorry covid misinformation or you know covid doubts you know, covid skepticism as being the exact same people that over the years have have uh have pushed climate misinformation and and somehow despite having been consistently proved wrong they they still retain a platform in you know media publications so i think you know as much as scientists and communicators can can do what but what Bruno said and, you know, stress uncertainties and all that and be careful. And as much as we can stress the positive messages, like, you know, like I've been saying and like Hannah was, was saying, there will always be some people that that will, you know, that kind of w will take the, the counter narrative and will will get a platform to do so. OK, I'm, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll have to stop here. Um, I was going to try to sum things up, but I won't. <laughs> um, I think, um, you know, be deliberate. Um, I guess what uh, the way to sum it up is talking to our audiences, as everyone here has said, be deliberate um, in in not just your science, but in what you want to communicate, who you want to communicate it to, how best to do that. Um, think about people as people you're trying to reach individuals you're trying to have a conversation with them in plain language about uh, why what you're doing matters and how that can um, improve the world that's a good way to end um, <laughs> I want to thank um, everyone on our panel Simon, Runa, Hannah, Bruno um, thanks to the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network and thanks to Springer Nature for having this event um, and thanks to you our audience um, everyone uh, enjoy the day.